just a bad day? Did you say something you didn't like? Why did you allegedly do it, Mike? Everyone wants to know why. What are you thinking, Mike? In the serene town of Summerfield, Florida, a seemingly ordinary family found themselves at the center of a horrifying and heart-wrenching tragedy. Michael Wayne Jones and his wife, Casey Jones, appeared to be leading a typical suburban life with their four beautiful children. However, beneath the facade of normalcy, a dark secret was brewing, threatening to shatter their seemingly idyllic existence. On the fateful summer day of July 10th, 2019, the seemingly ordinary lives of Michael and Casey Jones took a dark and unexpected turn. What began as a typical argument, much like any couple might experience, quickly escalated into a terrifying display of rage from Michael, a man who appeared unassuming to those around him. Michael had a troubled past that created a storm within his mind, leaving him vulnerable to his inner demons, and on that fateful summer day, the tension between Michael and Casey reached a boiling point when Michael was fueled by accusations of infidelity. Unable to contain his rage, Michael succumbed to a shocking outburst unleashing a wave of violence upon his wife that led to her horrifying death. Michael, driven by a sinister compulsion, ended the lives of his two young sons, strangling them before subjecting them to a horrifying fate of drowning within the confines of their own home. Meanwhile, Casey's lifeless body remained hidden in their bedroom, a haunting reminder of the shattered love that once existed within their household. In an attempt to mask his heinous acts, Michael deceived the children's grandmother, assuring her that Casey was merely unwell and needed time to recover. He dropped the two girls off at her place, and as the days turned into weeks without any word from Casey, concern grew, and her family's worst fears began to materialize. The boys' birthdays, usually a time of joyous celebration, passed by without any word or sign of life from their adoring mother. Consumed by anxiety for their well-being, Nikki, the grandma of the children and Casey's mother, mustered the courage to reach out to the authorities and urgently request a well-being check. Shortly before that, Michael had taken the two girls, Mercalli Jones and Ayana Jones, away from their grandmother, plunging them into a horrible fate as that of their two brothers. As detectives came to check up on Casey, they were presented by an eerie silence within their vacant and suspiciously cleaned-out residence that had already raised alarms among neighbors. In November 2019, months after the murders, a seemingly routine car crash would reveal the chilling truth. As law enforcement arrived at the scene, a pungent and overpowering odor hung in the air, leading them to uncover a makeshift grave concealed within the back of Michael's truck. It was there that the bodies of his wife and children had been carried, their lifeless forms tragically traveling with him all along. The horrifying reality of the crimes committed by a man who once appeared ordinary shook the nation to its core, leaving behind a community and a family forever scarred by unspeakable loss. And it was now the job of the detectives to uncover why and what exactly had happened. Um, she actually reached like we have a recliner in the in the living room, reached and grabbed after the bat, um, and kind of you know hit me you know broadside me or whatever. On July 10th, 2019, Michael and his wife Casey Jones found themselves embroiled in a heated argument. While the exact specifics of the altercation are not widely available, it is known that the tension between them escalated when Casey accused Michael of infidelity. As emotions reached a boiling point, the confrontation grew increasingly intense. In a moment of anger, Casey seized a baseball bat, wielding it as a symbol of her frustration. However, consumed by a surge of uncontrollable rage, Michael forcefully wrested the bat from her grasp and in a horrifying turn of events, used it to tragically beat Casey to death. Where did they sleep at now? Um, the boys have a bedroom. And then uh, the two girls uh, sleep in the, in, like, in the living room um, area. Okay. So when I... I've been to the house. I went to the house earlier today. Um, when I walk in the front door, obviously you walk in and you're in the living room, mm -hmm. right? And then the bed. There's a bedroom to the right, mm -hmm. closest to the road. Yes. 
Is that the, the boys. that's the boys' room? Yes, sir. Okay, and then the other room on the other end of the house is obviously y'all's, right? Yeah. Okay. In a disturbing and chilling sequence of events, Michael Jones committed an unimaginable act of horror by concealing Casey Jones's lifeless body within the confines of their own bedroom. The macabre scene unfolded as the decaying corpse remained hidden, casting a dark shadow over the home where their innocent children slept and played in the next room. It is believed that the growing stench emanating from the decomposing body alerted concerned neighbors. Time became a pressing factor, forcing Michael to make a desperate choice and flee with his children. So then it's summer, so the boys, um, her boys end up going with her father for a couple weeks. So I have the girls, just me and the girls. When did you take the boys to, to dad? You know, they came back uh, before the, tw the weekend before the 22nd. Okay. And they were gone for about 10 days, so maybe the the 12th of August or so. Okay, that's when they went to Dad's about the 12th, so a day or two after this happens. Michael made the decision to take his two sons, Cameron and Preston, to their biological father, Richard Bowers. The relationship between Michael and Richard had long been strained, marred by conflicts and unresolved issues. Unbeknownst to Richard, he would soon find himself unwittingly entangled in a sinister web of deception and darkness that would leave indelible scars on their lives. Let me ask you this. So you picked them up on July 27th. Yeah. Where do you pick them up at? At the, um, the mall in Leesburg. Do you know what time of day this was? Uh, let me see here. So I answered her back. Or no, so she she answered me back on July 26th, which was the next day, and she says, "Okay, so the mall. I need to know if you are going to Georgia with them or staying in Florida. Preston will have his meds. Do I need to send anything else, clothes or whatever?" Also, now this is the part where I was. So July 26th at 6:43. Also, I had major back surgery in November. Well, i am had another on Wednesday. I won't be leaving the hospital until the end of the weekend, which means if you want boys, Michael will be dropping them off. On July 26th, a sinister text message arrived on Richard Bauer's phone, seemingly from Casey herself. However, unbeknownst to Richard, it was actually Michael masquerading as his wife, weaving a web of deceit. The message cunningly requested Richard's assistance in caring for the children, citing Casey's purported back surgery and ongoing hospitalization as the reason she couldn't personally drop them off. The timing and content of the text immediately raised Richard's suspicions. He was all too aware of the strained history between himself and Michael, their tumultuous relationship marked by animosity and tension. It had always been Casey who handled the responsibility of delivering the children during their custody arrangements, making Michael's sudden appearance a glaring red flag for Richard. Now, before I continue, him and I have not had a good relationship. He's never dropped off the kids to me before, so right there, that, that threw that a, was red, a flag. red flag. Why, why is he dropping them off? Um, so she goes, so to continue, if you want boys, Michael will be dropping them off. I'll be there to pick them up. I'm sure that's not something you want to hear, but it's not something I can do anything about. Plus, the day you plan to drop off is my daughter's one-year birthday, so please let me know ASAP about drop-off time, then just so you know the boys coming to you isn't something that I am happy about at all. So when I had picked them up first from the mall to bring them back to Georgia to spend my two weeks with them, mm -hmm. I had my dad go with me because I had known that Michael was just going to go with me. Yeah, yeah just this yeah. guy like a backup, you know. So. Um, so my dad sat in the car, you know, Michael got out of the van, and it was really shocking, sir, because Michael had this, like, huge apology. You know, he's like, Richard, I just want to apologize, like, for believing everything that Casey's said about you, about how 
you know, you apparently abused her every day and you hit the kids and you did this and that, when clearly I know that that wasn't true and I know the kind of woman that she is. And I told him, and he remembered this saying, um, you know, a few years afterwards, because he even quoted it to me, and this was as, you know, I was bringing them to Georgia, um, but before we left the mall parking lot, when I had picked them up for the first time, he had said, Richard, I just want to tell you, you told me something a few years ago that re that rings in my ears. And I had told him, I said, you know, when we were in our altercation, I said, brother, I said, you, you, you freed me from 13 years of hell. Yeah. And I said, thank you. And he reiterated that to me. He, he reminded me of that. He said, I want to tell you that I never forgot those words that you told me because I know now what you meant to this very day. In a departure from their usual interactions, Michael initiated an unexpected and unusual conversation. He began by expressing remorse for having believed the lies his wife, Casey, had purportedly spread about Richard being an abusive husband prior to Michael and Casey's relationship. The true intentions behind Michael's words remain shrouded in uncertainty. It is unclear whether he sought to come clean with Richard, acknowledging the manipulation he had fallen victim to, or whether he aimed to cast a negative light on Casey, subtly attempting to mentally justify his own actions. Perhaps he sought to allude to Richard's previous statement, describing his experience of being together with Casey as a living hell. The complexity of Michael's words underscores the intricacies of human relationships and the blurred lines between truth, perception, and manipulation. Yeah, school's, you know, approaching. Boys come back. How do the boys end up back there, dude? I mean, obviously Dad would normally call, text, how would that happen? Um, it was previously, uh, with a drop-off, it was determined what time, you know, what, um, what day, um, time frame was up in the air, so he texted, and, uh, I went and picked him up. Okay. Shortly after Cameron and Preston returned from their father, Richard, Michael cold-heartedly took their lives through strangulation and drowning. This cruel act marked a chilling turning point in the unfolding of the crimes. With nothing left to lose and facing a potential lifetime in prison for the murder of his wife, Michael's descent into darkness led him to commit the unthinkable and take the lives of his innocent children. In his twisted logic, it may have seemed like the logical next step, driven by a malevolence that defies comprehension. So they're with Dad for about a little less than a month, right? Yeah. I think they were there for, like I said, I think 10 days or two weeks. Does he text her phone? Does he text your phone? How does that work? Um, I believe at first uh, he texted uh, her phone. Okay. I think we communicated the second time through my phone. Okay. May have been through her phone. Uh, and obviously at that point you got to keep up some sort of ruse that right. you're her, right? Right. Okay. Where are the girls at this time? Um, they were back with me that at that point. I had um, dropped them off at the, my mother-in-law's. Nikki. Nikki. Yeah. Okay. yeah. On August 1st, Nikki, the devoted grandmother of the children, received a text message from Casey's phone, innocently asking if she could watch the girls. Without hesitation, driven by her love and care for her grandchildren, Nikki readily agreed. Unbeknownst to her, a sense of unease settled in as Michael dropped off the girls. In the following weeks, Casey's absence became more apparent. The sporadic messages Nikki received from Casey asking to watch the kids for a longer duration were highly unusual and raised her worry. As time passed, there were no signs of life from Casey. Her once active presence on social media fell silent, with no new posts or any trace of her online activities. As the birthdays of the boys approached, without any invitation or indication of a celebration, the family's apprehension grew. Concerned for Casey's safety and the well-being of the children, they made the difficult decision to contact the authorities and request a well-being check. Their desperate efforts to intervene and uncover the truth came to a devastating halt when the authorities arrived at the residence. The air was heavy with the horrifying smell of human decay, and the home appeared abandoned with no signs of anyone being present. Um, can you share with us her, Casey's Facebook name? 
her face with me. Yeah. Um, is it princess? princess? Yeah, it's in the case of princess. What's her password for Facebook? I do not know. How did she so just log out because it was she, on her phone? Yeah, she kept it open. Okay. Um, so, <coughs> where's your phone at? They, they, uh, the deputy took it. Is that on the same phone? You still have the same phone from all that time? You just don't have any minutes on it? Right. It, uh, the, uh, bill is overdue and they turned it off a couple of days ago. Okay. So that's why when I called you a couple times, it went straight to voicemail? Yeah. Okay. So, obviously, you were staying with Sarah. Were you with her last night? Um, I was up there, yes. Okay. Up there at her place? Yeah, up up in Jacksonville. In the, is she staying in the apartment? Yeah, she okay. has apartments. Did you guys hear my phone call and stuff last night? What was the deal with all that? Before authorities were called to check up on the family, the two young girls, Mercalli and Ayana, tragically met the same fate as their brothers once they were picked up from their grandmother. In a desperate attempt to manipulate the situation further, Michael paid a visit to his ex-wife, Sarah, spinning a tale of separation from Casey and painting a grim picture of the dire situation at his trailer in Marion County, where he claimed there was no electricity. However, the fragile facade that Michael meticulously constructed began to crumble when an unexpected call from the Marion County Sheriff's Office jolted Sarah from her bewildered state. The inquiry focused on the whereabouts of Casey and the four missing children, casting a glaring spotlight on the unfolding tragedy. Confused and desperate for answers, Sarah turned to Michael, seeking clarity in the face of this unimaginable nightmare. With a chilling lack of remorse, Michael uttered the cryptic words, I am going to take care of it, before disappearing once again, leaving behind a trail of questions and haunting uncertainty. When, when, all, when any of these, these happened, were you drinking? Mm. No, no, you weren't drinking a bit. No alcohol, no drugs, no nothing. No clear head. Yeah. The unfolding of events reveals a chilling truth that defies comprehension. The horrors that transpired occurred with a disturbingly clear and sober state of mind. Even during his interrogation, Michael remained unsettlingly nonchalant, exhibiting a shocking absence of emotional response to the heinous acts he had committed. The weight of the evidence against him is insurmountable, leaving no room for denial or diversion from the grim reality. Following the devastating car crash that exposed his crimes, Michael offered no resistance in admitting his guilt for the murders. His confession, devoid of remorse or regret, further deepens the sense of horror surrounding this case, leaving us grappling with the cold, calculated nature of his actions. The perplexing time-lapse of events leaves us astounded, questioning how such a harrowing sequence could unfold within the family without any apparent signs of a struggle. In fact, the general consensus painted a picture of normalcy and stability, which stood in stark contrast to the truth that emerged. During Casey's relationship with Richard, there were noticeable signs of discord and turmoil. The struggles and challenges faced by the couple were evident to those around them, creating a sense of unease. However, the dynamics seemed to have shifted drastically after Michael entered the picture. Um, a couple of years ago, he was investigated. He had the kids for the weekend. It was Halloween, around Halloween. And uh, he, uh, the, the boys came back. Um, in their costumes, and um, the oldest Cameron had a uh, Batman costume, like a one piece. And you know, he's autistic and he has trouble, like, putting, you know, so it's like, hey, take this off. So I undid it, and as soon as I did, he was going pee, you need to go pee. So I hollered at his mother, and he had bruises all over his lower back. And really? Yeah, real bad. But there was going to be an arrest made, it never happened. Um, kind of fell through the cracks. I'm not really sure exactly how, you know, what went on with it other than um, that I guess he got an attorney and... Um During the second interrogation, Michael made the unsettling decision to bring up the past relationship between Casey and Richard, emphasizing the problems they faced that resulted in a legal case. The irony in this situation is stark, as Michael, the individual responsible for the brutal murder of his own family, chose to focus on the well-being of the children under Richard's care. This disturbing behavior further highlights his inability to confront his own actions and exposes the profound depths of evil within him. 
Amidst the unfolding tragedy, glimpses of relationship problems emerged, shedding light on the disturbing dynamics that existed between Michael and Casey. During the investigation, co-workers were interviewed, and their accounts revealed a troubling pattern. Um, no, I mean, uh, I had a, a job with a guy who made cabinets, and the company fell through. That was a year ago, though, right? No, no, or, no, no, this was, um, just a few months ago um, that I started there. What was his name? Um, I think I've talked to him, too. He said that you were getting phone calls all day long, and text messages all day long from Casey and... Oh, that would be Phil, probably. Yeah, yeah. I worked for him for a couple of years. They mentioned how Michael had grown increasingly irritated by the constant messages he received from Casey while he was at work. This fragment of insight into their relationship serves as a stark reminder of the underlying tension and discord that silently simmered beneath the surface. In stark contrast to Casey's loving nature and her genuine desire to care for her loved ones, she encountered a dark and twisted reality. A man who was supposed to be her partner and protector instead harbored a malevolent darkness within him, ultimately leading him to contemplate the unthinkable, the annihilation of his own family. Obviously the one question is, everybody's asked me, why? The true motivations behind this heinous act remain shrouded in uncertainty, leaving us to speculate about the dark and twisted psyche of Michael and the boiling cauldron of emotions that drove him to commit such unimaginable horrors. Michael's troubled past casts a long shadow over his life. Growing up in a household plagued by turmoil and instability, with his mother's revolving door of partners, created an environment rife with chaos. Tragically, he became a victim himself, suffering sexual abuse at the hands of one of his mother's partners. These early traumas left deep scars on his psyche, contributing to the complex web of torment that would shape his life. As time went on, Michael grappled with the weight of depression, a relentless companion that haunted his every step. To outsiders, he may have appeared as someone who had overcome a troubled past, striving to build a better life for himself. However, this case serves as a chilling reminder of the twisted reality that can lurk within the depths of human existence. It forces us to confront the unsettling truth that even those who have experienced profound suffering can turn into perpetrators of unfathomable evil. A jury in Marion County is recommending the death penalty for a man who killed his wife and four children. TV 20's Taylor Simpson tells us how some feel the fate of Michael Wayne Jones should be decided. Following an exhaustive investigation into the horrifying crimes perpetrated by Michael Wayne Jones, the justice system took action to hold him accountable for his actions. The presentation of overwhelming evidence during the trial left little room for doubt regarding his guilt. Throughout the trial, the prosecution painted a chilling portrait of the events that unfolded, highlighting the calculated nature, cruelty, and absence of remorse displayed by Michael. After careful deliberation of the distressing details and the weight of the evidence, the jury reached a unanimous verdict. Michael Wayne Jones was found guilty on multiple counts of murder. Judge Anthony Tatty of Marion County Circuit Court issued a verdict ordering the state to execute Michael for his crimes. The sentence included the death penalty for each of the murders committed against the children. He was also given a life sentence without the chance of parole for the murder of his wife, offering reassurance that justice had been served and that Michael would be held accountable for the unspeakable pain he had inflicted. With this outcome, they could find some closure knowing that he would never again have the opportunity to walk freely among society and perpetrate further harm.